Learning is one of the most fundamental concepts in all of psychology. Learning shapes personal habits, personality traits, personal preferences, and emotional responses. If all of your learned responses could somehow be stripped away, little of your behavior would be left. You would not be able to talk, read a book, or cook yourself a hamburger. You would be about as complex and interesting as a turnip. Learning is not an exclusively human process. It is pervasive in the animal world as well, a fact that won't amaze anyone who has ever owned a dog. In this uh, lecture, you'll see how fruitful the research into learning has been and how wide ranging its applications are. Research on learning is important and has many practical applications in many settings, including educational, professional, and business settings. And it's also allowed us to evaluate some learning fads. One is sleep assisted learning. Sleep learning is an attempt to convey information to a sleeping person, typically by playing a sound recording to them while they sleep. Many, including Tony Robbins, have promoted these products. Many studies have discredited the technique's effectiveness. But a few studies claim to have found that the brain indeed reacts to stimuli and processes them while asleep. However, these studies have been discredited for their poor methodology. For instance, the researchers couldn't be sure that the subjects hadn't just awoken to listen to the recording. Better controlled studies that monitored subjects' EEGs to make sure they were sleeping offered little evidence that sleep-assisted learning actually works. Still other companies promise consumers ultra-fast techniques for learning. These methods supposedly allow people to pick up new information at anywhere from 25 to several hundred times their normal learning speeds. Again, however, the evidence for the effectiveness of these techniques doesn't come close to matching the extraordinary claims. Few claims about learning are so widespread as the belief that all individuals have their own distinctive learning styles, their preferred means of acquiring information. According to proponents of this view, some students are analytical learners who excel at breaking down problems into uh, different components, whereas others are holistic learners who excel at viewing problems as a whole. Still others are verbal learners who prefer to talk through their problems, whereas others are spatial learners who prefer to visualize problems in their heads. Some educational psychologists have claimed to boost learning by matching different methods of instruction to students' learning styles. Now, appealing as these assertions are, they haven't stood the test of careful research. Well, for one thing, it's difficult to assess learning style reliably. Studies have generally revealed that tailoring different methods to people's learning styles doesn't result in enhanced learning. Now, like a number of other fads in uh, popular psychology, the idea of learning styles seems to be more fiction than fact. To a psychologist, learning is any relatively durable change in behavior or knowledge that is due to experience. In this lecture, we'll cover learning through classical conditioning, looking at the elements and procedures of classical conditioning, and understand the general learning principles in classical conditioning. We'll also explore learning through operant conditioning, through reinforcement and punishment. Uh, partial reinforcement schedules will also be covered, and we'll try to understand motivation, behavior, and reinforcement as it relates to operant conditioning. And finally, we'll conclude with the biological and cognitive aspects of learning, that there's uh, biological preparedness in learning, and we'll explore latent learning and observational learning. In general, two types of psychologists, behavioral psychologists and cognitive psychologists, have studied learning, and they've gone about their research in very different ways. Behavioral psychologists focus on the learning of associations through classical conditioning and operant conditioning. In classical conditioning, also known as Pavlovian conditioning, eventually the process results in an association between a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned response. Behaviorists refer to behaviors produced to receive a reward as operant, 
and this is known as operant conditioning. That is doing something to receive a reward. Dropping a dollar into a soda machine is operant as is asking someone out. In the first case, the reward is a refreshing soda. In the second, a hot date, if we're lucky. Cognitive psychologists focus more on complex types of learning involved in human memory. In other words, learning is more than just stimulus response, but recognizes that the person interprets and thinks before responding. Cognitive psychologists don't deny that classical and operant conditioning occur, but recognize that our interpretations and expectations can affect learning. Also, they recognize latent learning can occur by merely observing others. Classical conditioning is the process of learning in which one stimulus signals the arrival of another stimulus. Ivan Pavlov was the first researcher to systematically study this type of learning. Now, the history of science teaches us that many discoveries arise from serendipity or accident. Pavlov's primary research was digestion in dogs. In fact, his discoveries concerning digestion, not classical conditioning, earned him the Nobel Prize in 1904. While studying the initial step in the digestive process, uh, dogs were strapped into harnesses and had tubes inserted into their cheeks. The amount of salivation was measured. Now, with time, Pavlov noticed something. The dogs started to salivate before the meat powder was even put into their mouths. While studying digestion in dogs, Pavlov found that the dogs began salivating not only to the meat powder itself, but to previously neutral stimuli that had become associated with it, such as the research assistants who brought in the powder. Indeed, the dogs even salivated to the sound of these assistants' footsteps as they approached the laboratory. The dogs seemed to be anticipating the meat powder and responding to stimuli that signaled its arrival. Now, the elements and procedures of classical conditioning are as follows. First, there's a neutral stimulus, a stimulus that does not naturally elicit the to-be-conditioned response. It could be auditory tones or the research assistant's footsteps. Now, Pavlov used a metronome, a clicking pendulum that keeps time. Uh, in other studies, he used a tuning fork or whistle. Contrary to the popular belief, uh, Pavlov didn't use a bell. Now, there's an unconditioned stimulus, a stimulus in a reflex that automatically elicits the unconditioned response. Now, that would be the natural response that the dogs had meat powder and then salivation. The unconditioned response is a reflex that is automatically elicited by the unconditioned stimulus. As Pavlov repeatedly paired the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus, he observed something rather remarkable. If he now presented the metronome alone, it elicited a response, namely salivation. This new response is the conditioned response, CR, a response previously associated with a non-neutral stimulus that comes to be elicited by simply a neutral stimulus. Lo and behold, learning has occurred. The metronome had become the conditioned stimulus, a previously neutral stimulus that comes to elicit a conditioned response as a result of its association with an unconditioned stimulus. The dog, which previously did nothing when it heard the metronome, except perhaps to turn its head toward it, now salivates when it hears the metronome. To a review, the conditioned stimulus is a stimulus that comes to elicit a new response, the conditioned response in classical conditioning. The conditioned response is a response that is elicited by the conditioned stimulus in classical conditioning. The timing of the uh, relationship of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus is a crucial factor in classical conditioning. The conditioned stimulus, let's say a tone, is presented just before the unconditioned stimulus, the meat powder in Pavlov's experiments, because the conditioning involves learning that this stimulus is a uh, reliable predictor for the arrival of the meat powder, the unconditioned stimulus. Now, there are a couple of variations on how this can occur. One is called delayed conditioning. Uh, 
the offset of the conditioned stimulus is delayed until after the unconditioned stimulus is presented so that the two stimuli occur at the same time. Um, let's say a tone would be turned on and continue to sound until the meat powder was placed in the dog's mouth. Delayed conditioning is the most effective procedure for classical conditioning. Another variation is called trace conditioning. The period of time between the offset of the conditioned stimulus and the onset of the unconditioned stimulus when neither stimulus is present. Uh, let's say uh, the research assistant's footsteps are heard by the dog and the research assistant uh, walks in and places the meat powder on a table. And there are several minutes that go by before the meat powder is given to the dog. Now it is called trace conditioning because there must be a memory trace of the conditioned stimulus for the association between stimuli to be learned. Trace conditioning can be effective provided that the interval between the stimuli is brief. This can be a little tricky to uh, understand, so here's a brief summary of the elements of classical conditioning. Before conditioning, an unconditioned stimulus elicits an unconditioned response. The neutral stimulus does not elicit the to-be-conditioned response. Now, During conditioning trials, you present the neutral stimulus just before the unconditioned stimulus, which automatically elicits the unconditioned response. After conditioning, you find the conditioned stimulus, formerly the uh, non-conditioned stimulus or neutral stimulus, elicits the conditioned response. Here are some of the uh, terminology associated with the uh, general learning processes in classical conditioning. Acquisition. It's the process of acquiring a new response, that is a conditioned response to a conditioned stimulus. And the strength of the conditioned response increases during acquisition. Classical conditioning is powerful as we can even acquire emotions, such as positive emotions, through higher order conditioning. Taking conditioning a step further, organisms learn to develop conditioned associations to conditioned stimuli that are associated with the original conditioned stimulus. Higher order conditioning allows us to extend classical conditioning to a host of new stimuli. It helps to explain why we feel thirsty after someone merely says Coke on a hot summer day. We've already come to associate the sight, sound, and smell of a Coke with quenching our thirst, and we eventually came to associate the word Coke with these conditioned stimuli. Classical conditioning can be used in advertising to condition positive attitudes and feelings toward certain products. Do you have a favorite beverage? Well, in classical conditioning, the advertiser attempts to get the consumers to associate their product with a particular feeling or response in the hope that the consumer will then buy the product. For example, an ad for a fast food restaurant will usually make the food look pretty good and mouthwatering so that consumers will feel hungry when they watch the ad and want to go out and buy some of the food. Another example of classical conditioning occurs in ads where you see people having a good time using a product or see an attractive person drinking a beverage. Consumers may then associate good feelings and having fun with the product and may be more likely to buy the product. The ads may even associate drinking the product with values such as personal freedom and even coolness. After acquisition, some other processes can occur. Extinction, spontaneous recovery, stimulus generalization, and stimulus discrimination. Let's take a look at each of these more closely. In a process called extinction, the conditioned response decreases in magnitude and eventually disappears when the conditioned stimulus is repeatedly presented alone, that is, without the unconditioned stimulus. After numerous presentations of the metronome without meat powder, Pavlov's dogs eventually stopped salivating. Most psychologists once believed that extinction was similar to forgetting. The conditioned response fades away over repeated trials just as many memories gradually decay. Yet the truth is more complicated. The extinguished conditioned response 
doesn't vanish completely. In a phenomenon called spontaneous recovery, a seemingly extinct conditioned response reappears, often in somewhat weaker form, if we present the conditioned stimulus again. It's as though the conditioned response were lurking in the background, waiting to reappear following another presentation of the conditioned stimulus. During the extinction process, the conditioned response mysteriously increases somewhat in strength following a rest interval. As extinction continues, the recovery observed following rest intervals continues to decrease until it is minimized. Now this effect may help to explain why people with phobias, uh, intense irrational fears, who have overcome their phobias often experience a reappearance of their symptoms when they return to the environment in which they acquired the fears. Stimulus generalization is the elicitation of the conditioned response to a stimulus similar to the conditioned stimulus. Now, the more similar the stimulus is to the conditioned stimulus, the stronger the response will be. For example, if a dog learns to bark at the doorbell, she may, at least in a new home, also bark at similar sounds like a telephone because both stimuli are ringing noises. Now this is an adaptive process because classical conditioning would not be very useful if it only allowed us to learn relationships between specific stimuli. Stimulus discrimination is learning to give the conditioned response only to the conditioned stimulus or only to a very small set of very similar stimuli including the conditioned stimulus. Overgeneralizing a response may not be adaptive as people need to learn to discriminate uh, among stimuli. Uh, for example, after being in her new home for a period of time, uh, the dog will learn to differentiate or discriminate between the doorbell and other ringing noises. John Watson and Rosalie Rayner examined the generalization of conditioned fear in an 11-month-old boy known as Little Albert. Like many babies, Albert was initially unafraid of a live white rat. Then Watson and Rayner paired the presentation of the rat with a loud, startling sound made by striking a steel bar with a hammer. While Albert was looking at the little white rat, Watson quietly sneaked behind him and clanged the two together. Albert's reflexive response, the unconditioned response, was a fear avoidance response to the loud noise which was the unconditioned stimulus. After pairing the white rat with the unexpected loud noise only seven times, the white rat became a conditioned stimulus. Five days later, Watson and Rayner exposed the youngster to other stimuli that resembled the rat in being white and furry. They found that Albert's fear response generalized to a variety of stimuli, including a rabbit, a dog, a fur coat, a Santa Claus mask, and Watson's hair. Operant conditioning, or instrumental conditioning, is a form of associative learning in which the consequences of a behavior change the probability of the behavior's occurrence. American psychologist B.F. Skinner developed the concept of operant conditioning. Skinner chose the term operant to describe the behavior of the organism. According to Skinner, an operant behavior occurs spontaneously, and the uh, consequences that follow such a behavior determine whether it will be repeated. It's called operant conditioning because the organism needs to operate on the environment to bring about consequences from which to learn. Behaviors that are reinforced lead to satisfying consequences and will be strengthened. Behaviors that are punished lead to unsatisfying consequences and will be weakened. Now just imagine, for example, that you spontaneously decide to take a different route while driving to campus one day. You're more likely to repeat that route on another day if you have a pleasant experience. For instance, arriving at school faster or finding a great new coffee place to try than if you have a lousy experience, such as getting stuck in traffic. In either case, the consequence of your spontaneous act influences whether that behavior happens again. 
Although Skinner emerged as the primary figure in operant conditioning, the experiments of E.L. Thorndike established the power of consequences in determining voluntary behavior. At about the same time that Pavlov was conducting classical conditioning experiments with salivating dogs, Thorndike, an American psychologist, was studying cats in puzzle boxes. Thorndike put a hungry cat inside a box and placed a piece of fish outside. To escape from the box and obtain the food, the cat had to learn to open the latch inside the box. At first, the cat made a number of ineffective responses. It clawed or bit at the bars and thrust its paws through the openings. Eventually, the cat accidentally stepped on the lever that released the door bolt. When the cat returned to the box, it went through the same random activity until it stepped on the lever once more. On subsequent trials, the cat made fewer and fewer random movements until it finally immediately stepped on the lever to open the door. Thorndike's resulting law of effect states, any behavior that results in satisfying consequences tends to be repeated, and any behavior that results in unsatisfying consequences tends not to be repeated. Bear with me as there's some basic terminology we need to go through to uh, discuss operant conditioning. A reinforcer is a stimulus that increases the probability of a prior response. Reinforcement is the process by which the probability of a response is increased by the presentation of a reinforcer following the response. A punisher is a stimulus that decreases the probability of a prior response. Punishment is the process by which the probability of a response is decreased by the presentation of a punisher following the response. For example, if you conditioned your dog to stop getting up on the couch by spraying her with water each time she got up on the couch, the spraying would be the punisher and the process of decreasing her couch jumping behavior would be called punishment. Here's some terminology that can get a little tricky if you're not careful. In positive reinforcement, the frequency of a behavior increases because it is followed by the presentation of something that increases the likelihood that the behavior will be repeated. For example, if someone you meet smiles at you after you say, hello, how are you? And you keep talking, the smile has reinforced your talking. The same principle of positive reinforcement is at work when you teach your dog to shake hands by giving it a piece of food when it lifts its paw. In contrast, in negative reinforcement, the frequency of a behavior increases because it is followed by the removal of something. For example, if your father nagged you to clean out the garage and kept nagging until you cleaned out the garage, your response cleaning out the garage removed the unpleasant stimulus, your dad's nagging. Taking uh, an aspirin when you have a headache works the same way. A reduction of pain reinforces the act of taking an aspirin. Now uh, notice that both positive and negative reinforcement involve rewarding behavior, but they do so in different ways. Positive reinforcement means following a behavior with the addition of something and negative reinforcement means following a behavior with the removal of something. Remember that in this case, positive and negative have nothing to do with good and bad. Now a stimulus can be classified as either appetitive or aversive. An appetitive stimulus is one that the organism finds pleasing. For example, food or money. An aversive stimulus is one that an organism finds unpleasing such as sickness or social isolation. So positive means that something is presented and negative means that something is taken away. Reinforcement means that the behavior is strengthened and punishment means that the behavior is weakened. In positive reinforcement, an appetitive stimulus is presented and in positive punishment, an aversive or unpleasant stimulus is presented. In negative reinforcement, an aversive stimulus is removed. And in negative punishment, an appetitive stimulus is removed. Now, in any example of positive or negative reinforcement or punishment, it is critical to realize that we only know if a stimulus has served as a reinforcer or a punisher and led to reinforcement or punishment. If the behavior happens again or stops happening, 
Psychologists also classify positive reinforcers as primary or secondary, based on whether the rewarding quality of the consequences is innate or learned. A primary reinforcer is innately satisfying, that is, a primary reinforcer does not require any learning on the organism's part to make it pleasurable. Food, water, and sexual satisfaction are primary reinforcers. A secondary reinforcer, on the other hand, acquires its positive value through an organism's experience. A secondary reinforcer is a learned or conditioned reinforcer. We encounter hundreds of secondary reinforcers in our lives, such as getting an A on a test and a paycheck for a job. Now, although we might think of these as quite positive outcomes, they are not innately positive. We learn through experience that A's and paychecks are good. One of the general learning processes in operant conditioning is shaping. Shaping is necessary when an organism does not on its own emit the desired response. Shaping occurs when an animal is trained to make a particular response by reinforcing successively closer approximations to the desired response. Now, this is the key to training animals to perform impressive tricks like uh, riding bicycles or playing the piano. With humans, it might mean reinforcing a child with the closer he comes to making his bed correctly each morning. Now, to keep track of progress in operant conditioning, psychologists will keep a cumulative record. It includes the total number of responses over time in an operant conditioning experiment. It's a visual depiction of the rate of responding. What happens as the slope of the line in a cumulative record gets steeper? As the slope of a line in a cumulative record gets steeper, the response rate is faster. By measuring how responses accumulate over time, a cumulative record shows the rate of responding. Now, when no responses occur, the record is flat. In other words, it has no slope. As the number of responses increases per unit of time, the cumulative total rises more quickly, and the response rate is reflected in the slope of the record. Again, the faster the response rate, the steeper the slope of the record. The general learning processes in operant conditioning are similar to those in classical conditioning. There's acquisition, the strengthening of the reinforced operant response. Extinction is the disappearance of the operant response when it is no longer reinforced. The decreasing slope of the cumulative record indicates that the response is being extinguished. There are fewer and fewer responses over time. For example, we learn that by putting money into a vending machine, we get something we really like. We acquire the response of inserting money into this particular machine. But one day we put money in and get no food out. This happens again. Soon we stop putting money in the vending machine. Our response is being extinguished. However, after a period of time, we go back and try again. And this is spontaneous recovery. If the machine has, has been repaired, we will uh, get our food and our response rate will return to its uh, previous level. Now, if not, we will continue along our extinction trail. As in classical conditioning, discrimination and generalization are learning processes in operant conditioning. A discriminative stimulus is a stimulus that has to be present for the operant response to be reinforced. It uh, sets the occasion for the response to be reinforced. For example, birds learn that uh, hunting for worms is likely to be reinforced after a rain. Children learn to ask for sweets when their parents are in a good mood. Drivers learn to slow down when the highway is wet. In an experiment, a rat learns that pressing a lever will result in food only when a light is on, but not when the light is off. This is stimulus discrimination. Stimulus generalization involves giving the operant response in the presence of stimuli similar to the discriminative stimulus. For example, rats learn to uh, press the lever for food only when the light is a certain shade of red. Presentation of different colored lights following acquisition constitutes a test for generalization.
When psychologists reinforce a behavior, they can use various schedules of reinforcement. A schedule of reinforcement is a specific pattern of presentation of reinforcers over time. The simplest pattern is continuous reinforcement, where every instance of the designated response is reinforced. Intermittent reinforcement occurs when a designated response is reinforced only some of the time. Which do you suppose leads to longer lasting effects, being reinforced every time or being reinforced only some of the time? Studies show that given an equal number of reinforcements, intermittent reinforcement makes a response more resistant to extinction than continuous does. First, let's look at interval schedules, and the key thing to remember here is time. In a fixed interval schedule, a reinforcer is delivered after the first response is given once a set interval of time has elapsed. And an example would be the periodic exams in a class, with the most behaving or studying occurring right before the exam. In a variable interval schedule, a reinforcer is delivered after a different time interval on each trial. Now an example would be fishing. You don't know if the fish will bite in the next minute, in a half an hour, in an hour, or ever. Now because it is difficult to predict when a reward will come, behavior is slow and consistent on a variable interval schedule. If we look at the cumulative record for fixed interval and variable interval schedules of partial reinforcement, we notice something rather interesting. The tick marks indicate when reinforcers were delivered for each of the two schedules. The flat sections following reinforcements for the fixed interval schedule indicate periods when little or no responding occurred. Now, such pauses do not occur for a variable interval schedule. A variable interval schedule leads to steady responding. Ratio schedules in operant conditioning are a little different in they relate to the number of responses uh, that are being made. In a fixed ratio schedule, while it's a partial uh, schedule of reinforcement in which a reinforcer is delivered each time a fixed number of responses in, is made. Now the fixed number can be any number greater than one. For example, if you're playing the slot machines in Atlantic City, and if the machines are on a fixed ratio schedule, you might get $5 back every 20th time you put money in the machine. Now, it wouldn't take long to figure out that if you watch someone else play the machine 18 or 19 times and not get any money back and then walk away, uh, you should step up and search your coin and get back $5. A variable ratio schedule is a partial schedule of reinforcement in which the number of responses it takes to obtain a reinforcer varies on each trial, but averages to a set number uh, across trials. Now the magic of variable schedules of reinforcement is that the uh, person can never be sure exactly when the reward is coming, so uh, the person is more likely to uh, engage in continuous uh, behavior. Here you can see both ratio schedules lead to high rates of responding as indicated by the steep slopes of the two cumulative records. Each tick mark indicates when a reinforcer was delivered. As you can see, the tick marks appear regularly in the record for the fixed ratio schedule, but irregularly in the record for the variable ratio schedule. A fixed ratio schedule leads to short pauses after reinforcement, but these pauses don't occur as often for a variable ratio schedule. Here you can see a, a very nice chart uh, from the text which uh, summarizes the four partial reinforcement schedules and their effects on uh, response rate. And uh, I encourage you to uh, study this uh, chart very carefully. I think it will help you uh, in the exam. Which schedule is best? Well, it depends on what the target behavior is. Ratio schedules lead to higher rates of responding than do interval schedules. With respect to extinction, it will take longer to extinguish a response with a partial reinforcement schedule than with a continuous reinforcement one. Variable schedules lead to fewer breaks after reinforcement than do fixed schedules. Most of the research on reinforcement schedules was conducted on rats and pigeons. However, psychologists have found that humans react to schedules of reinforcement in much the same way. For example, when animals are placed on a ratio schedule, 
shifting to a higher ratio tends to generate faster responding. Managers who run factories that pay on a piecework basis have seen the same reaction in humans. In a similar vein, most uh, gambling is reinforced according to variable ratio schedules, which tend to produce rapid, steady responding and great resistance to extinction, exactly what the casino operators want. The final section of the lecture covers biological and cognitive aspects of learning, beginning with biological preparedness in learning. We have a unique readiness to make connections between taste and nausea. Our preparedness to learn to fear objects dangerous to us and to avoid foods and drinks that make us sick has adaptive significance. Evolution has programmed organisms to acquire certain taste aversions readily. Being able to quickly develop taste aversions increases the chances of an animal or human surviving, reproducing, and passing on their genes to their offspring. Taste aversion is a learned response to eating food that is toxic, spoiled, or poisonous. It is based on classical conditioning. If an animal eats a food that makes them sick, they will then avoid eating that food in the future as they associate it with illness. Researchers have found that when rats were given a sweetened liquid and then injected with a drug or exposed to radiation, it caused nausea and resulted in the rats not touching the liquid ever again. It is interesting to note how a single trial learning establishes an immediate automatic response of taste aversion. One negative experience can lead to permanent aversion of a certain food. Evidence of a tendency to possess a survival mechanism in the body which avoids any potentially poisonous substances. Another cognitive aspect in learning is motivation, which is a set of internal and external factors that energize behavior and direct it toward goals. There are three theories of motivation that we'll take a look at. Drive reduction theory explains motivation in this way. First, there is a bodily need, such as hunger, which creates a state of bodily tension called drive. Motivated behavior, seeking food, works to reduce this drive, and this is done by obtaining reinforcement, the food, to eliminate this need and return the body to a balanced internal state. In essence, we are pushed into action by unpleasant drive states, and this is effective uh, at explaining biological needs, such as hunger and thirst. Incentive theory is another perspective which proposes that we are pulled into actions by incentives. Incentives are external environmental stimuli that do not involve drive reduction. For instance, students may be motivated by getting good grades, uh, leading them to work and study hard. Money is another classic example of an incentive that pulls us into behaving in certain ways. And the last theory of motivation we'll look at is arousal theory, which purports that behavior is motivated to maintain an optimal level of arousal, which varies among people. When below the optimal level, people are motivated to raise arousal to that level. When over aroused, people are motivated to lower arousal level to the optimal level. So arousal theory argues that our level of arousal impacts our performance level with a certain level being optimal. The arousal theory of motivation goes along with the yerkes dodson law, which is very straightforward. Increased arousal will aid performance up to a point, after which further arousal impairs performance. Taken together, these theories make a distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is a desire to perform a behavior to obtain an external reinforcement or to avoid an external aversive stimulus. Intrinsic motivation is a desire to perform a behavior effectively for its own sake, and reinforcement is provided by the activity itself. For example, why do students study for classes? Well, an extrinsic motivator would be grades. An intrinsic motivator would be simply enjoyment of learning new information. Edward Tallman's contributions to the psychology of learning can't be overestimated. Tallman suspected that reinforcement wasn't the be-all and end-all of learning. 
According to Tallman, you engaged in latent learning, learning that isn't directly observable. We learn many things without showing them. Putting it a bit differently, there's a crucial difference between competence, what we know, and performance, showing what we know. For example, students study for classes, but do not openly demonstrate learning until an exam, for which the incentive is a good grade. One of the important variations of latent learning is observational learning. That learning can occur without reinforcement by observing others and imitating their behavior. This is important. Tolman contended that reinforcement isn't necessary for learning. Here's how Tolman demonstrated this point systematically. Tolman randomly assigned three groups of rats to go through a maze over a three-week period. One group always received reinforcement in the form of cheese when it got to the end of the maze. A second group never received reinforcement when it got to the end of the maze. The first group, the green line, made far fewer errors. Now that's no great surprise. A third group of rats received no reinforcement for the first 10 days and then started receiving reinforcement on the 11th day, the green line compared to the red. As we can see in the figure, the rats in the third group, represented by the blue line, showed a large and abrupt drop in their number of errors after receiving their very first reinforcer. In fact, within only a few days, their number of errors didn't differ significantly from the number of errors among the rats who were always reinforced. According to Tolman, this finding means that the rats in the third group had been learning all along. They hadn't bothered to show it because they had nothing to gain. Once there was a payoff for learning, namely a tasty morsel of cheese, they promptly became miniature maze masters. Observational learning is learning by watching others. In many cases, we learn by watching models, parents, teachers, and others who are influential to us. Many psychologists regard observational learning as a form of latent learning because it allows us to learn without reinforcement. We can merely watch someone else being reinforced for doing something and take our cues from them. In classic research in the 1960s, Albert Bandura and his colleagues demonstrated that children can learn to act aggressively by watching aggressive role models. In Bandura's pioneering research with the Bobo doll experiment, children were exposed to an adult who beats, kicks, and yells at a Bobo doll, or to a room with a gentler adult model. They were later taken to another room with accessible toys, including a Bobo doll. When exposed to a gentle model, children acted more gently toward the doll than did children exposed to the aggressive model. Children's behavior was guided by the behavior of the model to which they were exposed. In another experiment, an adult was rewarded for aggressive behavior, punished for aggressive behavior, or received no consequences. Children who saw the adult get reinforced for aggressive behavior acted more aggressively toward the Bobo doll than did those who had seen the model act with no consequences. Children who had watched the adult get punished were less likely to act aggressively toward the doll than were children who had not been exposed to any consequences for acting aggressively toward the doll. Recent research by neuroscientists has led to the discovery of neuron systems that provide a neural basis for observational learning, called mirror neurons. Now, no one knows for sure what mirror neurons do or why they're in our brains, but some neuroscientists have conjectured that such neurons play a central role in empathy, including feeling others' emotional states and emulating their movements. When we see an athlete suffer an injury during a sporting event, like a baseball player grimacing in agony after a bruising slide into home plate, we wince in pain along with him. In some sense, we may be feeling his pain because the mirror neurons that correspond to the neurons in his motor areas are becoming activated. Some authors have gone further to speculate that mirror neuron abnormalities play a key role in infantile autism, which is often associated with difficulties in adopting the perspectives of others. But whether these neurons play a role in causing autism is unknown as the findings are only correlational.